Auxerre and be prepared to laugh and cry <laughs> and celebrate her journey. It wasn't very far into the questioning process when a woman stood up with her Bible open and said, according to the Word of God, God made you a man, meaning that God gave me male genitals. How can you justify what you've done? When Steve confessed his sin to me, it was all about sin. It had nothing to do with gender identity. And if we loved the Lord enough, and I loved him enough, gave him enough of myself, then it would be okay. Christmas Eve, 1997, walked away from the church, walked away from my faith, and I thought that I had walked away from God. Like many other transsexuals, I had reached the point where it was either transition or just end it. People who are to be ordained in the Presbyterian Church USA have to live either in fidelity in the covenant of marriage between a man or a woman or in chastity and singleness. And so without naming gays and lesbians at all, it eliminates them from the ability to be ordained. It, it, it gets tricky with, with ordaining people who are transgender because, um, because others in the, in the church want to know, is this person going to be in relationship with somebody of the same gender? And if he is or she is, then, uh, then that person is not ordainable in the Presbyterian Church USA yet. When Sarah and Jen first came to me and said, they wanted to get married. I was so delighted for both of them. Both uh, have had difficult lives and they really deserve to have this love in their lives. But almost the first question I had was, are you thinking about Sarah's ordination? The really conservative evangelical part of the church doesn't accept me as a woman. They see me as a gay man who's had my body mutilated. I'm trying to live as a woman, but they still see me as a gay man. So I don't know how they're going to respond if and when they find out about Jen's and my relationship. It would be interesting to hear them try to justify condemning me for being a man trying to live as a woman and then accusing me of being in a same-sex relationship when I'm with a woman. I'm Rachel Wiederhaeft and I'm a board member of Join the Impact Massachusetts and I'm also a filmmaker in my professional life, um, but it's not about me. So um, uh, our first panel, panelist is Sarah Herwig. She holds a Master's of Divinity from Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary here in Massachusetts. She transitioned from living in the male gender role to living in the female gender role in 1997. From 99 until 2001, she was the Director of Operations at the International Foundation for Gender Education, uh, where she became involved in educating others about transgender issues. She has given presentations and led workshops for graduate classes at Harvard, Boston University, Andover Newton Theological School, and the Human Resources Department of the University of New Hampshire, Planned Parenthood of Northern New England, and various conferences. Most of her education and advocacy work has been done in the Presbyterian Church. Um, she is on the national board of That All May Freely Serve, one of um, several organizations in the PCUSA, sorry, uh, working for full inclusion <laughs> of all people um, in the, the life and ministry of the church. She is currently under care of the Presbytery of Boston and was certified ready to seek a call for ordination in the Ministry of Word and Sacrament in August of 2006. And we're going to skip. <laughs> and a 
unfortunately, Alice, I don't have a written. So, do you want to talk more about yourself a little bit quick? A bio? Uh, oh, um, gee, I'm sorry about no, that. No, no problem. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I've been working as um, a documentary filmmaker for about 15 years, and I started, uh, I went to film school in the 80s at BU, and then um, I became a, uh, what they call a DGA trainee, working on feature films in, that came into Boston and New York and out of LA, and then worked as an assistant director for about 10 years before kind of segueing into um, documentary filmmaking. So I've been doing that the past uh, 15 years. And um, uh, this particular film, Thy Will Be Done, is a real detour for me and um, has been a real gift and an education. So um, I'm glad everybody had a chance to see it. Thank you. And our last panelist is Rafi Friedman Gerspen, who is the legislative and policy staffer for the Mass Massachusetts Transgender Political Coalition. She's also the LGBT liaison for the city of Somerville and works part-time at the Women's Studies program at Boston University. Adopted from Central America and raised in the greater Boston area, Rafi has a strong multicultural background and has worked continuously since high school on human rights issues, including LGBT matters. A graduate of St. Olaf College in Northfield, Minnesota, in, uh, um, with a degree in political science, she hopes to pursue a career in public policy making. So. <laughs> As we begin the actual Q&A, um, I would just like to outline a few guidelines. Um, most of us in this room uh, understand that transgender issues are both very personal and public, um, but I just want to really reemphasize we are all here today to learn as much as we can about these issues surrounding transgender life and um, civil rights. We are not here to um, insist that anyone in the panel or anyone in the audience um, to discuss matters that they feel is too personal. Um, we want to be supportive, and I want to encourage anyone from in, who's here today uh, who feels uncomfortable about any situation to either politely decline answering a question or just you know raise your hand and let me know. So I just want to put that out there. Um, so. First question is, um, could each of you please just describe a little bit more about yourself and your connection to the transgender community? Okay. Um, so I am trans identified. Um, I came out uh, during college um, and have always been involved with the broader LGBT community. So I think for me, it was just trying to find out uh, which part of that acronym I was correctly associated with. But I like to say that I'm part of it all. Um, and I specifically got involved with MTPC uh, last year, um, began interning there on, on public policy issues, and uh, loved it, and so decided to stay on. And um, I'm now the legislative uh, person. I also uh, co-chair our policy committee, and I'm a, I'm a member of the steering committee as well. Um, I'm actually not a member of the LGBT community, nor am I a member of the faith community. So she's um, an honorary member. Of the yeah, community. that's right. <laughs> yes, the trans add community. A at the end for Card carrying. Ally. Yeah, she is a, <laughs> she's right. definitely an ally. <laughs> definitely. And um, uh, as I mentioned before, it's uh, as an outsider coming into this um, subject matter was uh, daunting um, because I knew so little about it. But um, over the course of eight years that it took me to make this film, I had many uh, conversations both on and off camera with Sarah and members, other members of the trans community. and learned uh, a lot and really see it as um, a real gift and an education to have been able to make this film. Um, I, I see a lot of validity to, to, make, uh, to make films as an, as an insider, but as an outsider, I also feel like I had a perspective that perhaps a more general, broader audience might um, might have, have, have had questions about and might have known. So I think that I can 
uh, also offer a certain validity to um, making a film about a community um, as an outsider, providing that I have my guides. And I had some wonderful guides in helping me and um, really wanted Sarah and others in the film to speak for themselves. And I hope that, uh, that, that, that I was successful in doing that. So. Mm. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I want to thank Alice for the respectful and beautiful way that she told not only my story, but the story of my, my family. And uh, it's, it's been a ride. It has. <laughs> a journey. It's been a real journey <laughs> together. Um, Mr. Toad's wild ride. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. Um, well, those of you in the audience here have seen the film, so there's not really a lot that I can <laughs> add to that. Those of you that are just seeing this portion of the program on, um, you know, on TV, um, for, for you I will say that I've struggled with uh, my gender identity my whole life. Um, it wasn't really until kindergarten that I realized that I was not like that I was different um, and that maybe I wasn't like all the other girls that I thought I was like um, and I learned very quickly to to hide that part of myself and pushed myself um, with my father's um, urging to uh, become to have more of a masculine presentation, to be involved in more boyish things. And, uh, and it wasn't really until um, after my first wife and I were divorced that I came to, came to terms with my own gender identity and accepted the fact that I'm transsexual. And uh, as my bio said, I, I uh, began my transition in 97 and uh, Finished it in uh, 98. Um, was working at uh, IFGE, International Foundation for Gender Education. And uh, through that whole process, I got called back into the church um, through the help of some friends who weren't going to let me go away and, uh, and picked up the, uh, the process of ordination again while still doing trans education and advocacy. It just kind of shifted from being outside the church to being more centered within um, the Presbyterian denomination. Great. So um, my next question is based around the fact that um, most members, if not all members of the LGBT community in as a whole face a lot of stereotypes and stigmas that are unfounded and unjust, but from my perception, um, transgender people face these to what some could call is an extreme um, exaggeration or just these are much larger and much harder to face. Um, one of the major themes that comes through to me in Thy Will Be Done and almost all trans positive films and media programs is that transgender people are simply looking to surpass these stigmas and stereotypes. Um, and to just live as, quote, mainstream, um, and to worry about things like rent and bills and finding love, <laughs> and not to be worrying about um, gender identity. Um, and so I was just wondering if each of you could speak about whether you agree or disagree with sort of that thesis in general, and what can um, allies and transgender people alike do to uh, push the culture um, if that is, if you agree with that thesis, to to make it more accepting and to be more about, I'm just trying to pay my bills. <laughs> um, I'll I'll pick that up. Sure. Um, I think that that's generally true. Um, that most of us in the trans community just want to live our lives as authentically and productively as we can, as any other citizen. Um, with the same rights and protections that any other citizen has. Unfortunately, um, 
we don't have those same rights and protections. And um, thanks to Rafi and others involved in that whole process, we're hoping to get legislation passed here in Massachusetts that was laid aside last year um, that will add uh, the specific phrase gender <coughs> identity and expression so that those of us who are trans will be covered uh, by that. And, uh, and I think in terms of allies um, to the community and to those you know, who know us individually to just, um, you know, let us, let us live our lives. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've chosen to be out um, as an advocate and um, as an educator, but I'm not this way everywhere I go. I don't go through the line in the grocery store and pay for my groceries and say, oh, and by the way, I'm a transsexual. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I don't, I don't go wash my car in a taffeta ball gown. <laughs> In fact, I don't own a taffeta ball gown, and I'm, I'm psychologically allergic to it, to taffeta in general. Um, but, but I think that's the real goal, is for each of us, whether we're trans, uh, trans ally, uh, gay, lesbian, bisexual, gender queer, queer, questioning, uh, whatever part of the alphabet soup you want to pull up, um, including straight, that what we want is to live our lives authentically and to, um, to enjoy the same rights and protections that uh, any other normal citizen <coughs> would have. And, and to be able to be productive in society. Um, a lot of employers who won't in hire transgender people, uh, including some of the mainline denominations who haven't quite gotten there yet, um, are missing out on people who have tremendous gifts to offer to society and to groups and employers by um, their prejudice and their ignorance. So I'll shut up now. <laughs> <clears throat> I guess um, to pick up on that, I would say it's also about um, accessibility and opportunities. I think the thing that folks mm -hmm. don't realize initially about our community is that Unfortunately, we are um, a very uh, underemployed community, a very poor community. Um, we obviously hear about violence and discrimination, but the other thing is that a lot of us do have degrees, do ha have gone through um, the structures of American society, but are not, um, you know, reaping the, the benefits, as it were. Um, so what we at MTPC are fighting for is for <coughs> the trans community to be part of the larger civic society, to be engaged in all levels, um, economic, social, educational. Um, so my dream would be that um, we are, quote unquote, mainstreamed into society where it no longer matters, just like with gay and lesbian and bisexual folks. Um, obviously for us it's a larger struggle because frankly we are 20 years behind uh, the gay and lesbian community um, and just to cite an example uh, in 2009 the department of uh, health here in massachusetts did a um, survey of the lgbt community in terms of health and found that in all the categories that they looked at transgender people um, did the worst. It, um, they were right behind bisexual people, but that gay and lesbian folks did best in terms of um, health care uh, disparities, but um, trans people did the worst. So I think the thing is also recognizing that we um, have a lot of problems in our community uh, and they need to be addressed by our policymakers. And um, yeah, like I said, I, I think it's just about us getting into society and, and proving ourselves. And as Sarah just said, I mean, people are missing out from a whole range of folks that bring a lot of beautiful gifts to um, society. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, I just wanted to add a real quick thing. As, a, as an ally, I think it's also our, as allies, I think it's our job too, particularly as filmmakers or people who are working in, in any kind of med form of media to, um, to be careful about the presentation and also when when we do present something or you know write the story show the story um, that we are representing accurately authentically and that we are um, uh, 
trying to, uh, to to tell a story in the in the in the best possible way we can to kind of elicit a certain sense of sensitivity and understanding and um, in a, in the most positive light possible. So. Mm -hmm. It's interesting um, to watch the um, the late night TV shows and the monologues and. I haven't actually done a count, but my gut feeling is that there are probably the trans jokes to gay and lesbian jokes are probably um, three to one. Um, we're one of the few groups in society that it's okay to make fun of. And another thing that people who are allies can do is, you know, like they say on the subway, if you see something, say something. Mm -hmm. um, well, if you hear something, Say, say something. Yeah. Say, just say, you know, that's not appropriate. Mm -hmm. You know, I know people who are transgendered, and that's nothing like who they are. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there's, there's a way that, that our allies can stand up as well. So, uh, I'm just going to skip to the policy one, because mm -hmm. you brought it up, and sure. I think it really relates back to this question. So, I'd love for you to just talk about the policy issues sure. um, quickly. Yeah. So, um, as Sarah said, we are working on a piece of legislation known right now as the, um, an act relative to gender-based discrimination and hate crimes. Um, and that legislation, unfortunately, did not um, go through our um, Massachusetts uh, State House, um, but we are refiling. Um, what this bill would do would add gender identity and gender expression as a protected category in the areas of employment, um, education, public uh, accommodations, credit, housing. So this would really um, positively benefit the trans community in, in a number of areas. And it would also add gender identity and uh, expression to the hate crimes laws in Massachusetts. Um, so that, um, unfortunately, if there is an incident of a hate crime being, per, um, being done to a trans person, that there is um, full recourse of the law and, and it's seen as um, a hate crime. In terms of policy, um, what MTPC and other partners are doing um, is working with uh, local uh, state agencies and um, private enterprises to incorporate trans issues uh, into um, discussions about um, better services. Uh, for instance, um, MTPC has done work with the Massachusetts Commission Against Discrimination about uh, employment discrimination that the trans community faces. I think probably the the big thing that um, we find is that most people just don't know about our issues. And um, it's, it's a lot of educating, but it's also fighting for the right policies and saying not just having, it's not just about um, you know, locker rooms or bathrooms, it's also about making sure that our folks um, make, it, you know, make it through to become um, you know, professors at colleges, to become pastors at, at um, I mean, obviously that's church and state, but, you know, that people have access to jobs, and I think that's the biggest thing for us, is that our folks, again, just don't have the same um, opportunities that other people do, just because um, of how they identify. Um, so those are sort of, that's like a broad scope um, of what we do. Um, and it's, and it's a, it, I guess what I would say in terms of what allies can do is to become involved um, around pushing for the legislation, about pushing for trans inclusion, just like um, so many of you have wonderfully done and, and, stu and uh, should still be doing um, with gay and lesbian issues, but also to make sure that the trans, um, the trans voice is not uh, lost. Um, I also think it's important on the national level when we're talking about what's going on nationally. I think we all know about the Employment Non-Discrimination Act and how there was some cr controversy around whether the trans community should be dropped off from that and just gay and lesbian folks get through. Thankfully, uh, the larger LGBT community said absolutely no, it's an all or nothing bill. Um, so I guess on the national level, it's again pushing for full inclusion of trans and gay and lesbian and bi. Um, so hopefully, I th my feeling is things are going in a better direction. Um, I was actually at a conference uh, in Baltimore this past summer and meeting with lots of trans and gay and lesbian activists from around the country. And the trend is um, surprisingly moving in our favor in a lot of uh, small areas like uh, tax courts uh, where there was a ruling in favor of trans people and, and protecting our, um, our um, 
medical procedures to be uh, tax exempt. Um, and then also in terms of non-discrimination, we've actually seen some victories in the South and in the West where you wouldn't necessarily um, think there would be victories. So um, I guess my message is that just folks continue to be involved and uh, please do join MTPC and, and, and join the Impact and other like-minded organizations around fighting for um, fair-minded policies. And write your representatives. Yeah, and write your representatives. Please contact your legislators. Uh, this um, coming uh, January, we'll be re refiling the bill. Um, and I would say it doesn't matter what their party um, affiliation is, it's important to talk to all legislators. And I feel like um, when we when it failed, there was discussion about that it was really if it had gotten to the floor. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to write the people who are on the committee, mm -hmm. correct? Yes, I. Um, it's especially important to write to. Um, I would say the chair, the the co chairs of the judiciary committee. That's the committee in the um, legislature that will be overseeing our bill, um, and. I would say it's also important to write to the leadership. Um, that would include uh, Senate President Trace Murray and um, Speaker Robert DeLeo. Um, but we encourage folks, uh, however they feel about this um, issue, to just be engaged. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so I had a couple other questions, but right. I think I want to open it up to you guys because I think you probably ask a lot of the same questions. So if anyone has any questions that they want to jump up to the microphone, please feel free. Uh, yay, we have a brave soul. Thank you, Matt. Uh, my name is Matthew Dimmick. I'm a member of Join the Impact Massachusetts, a student at Boston University School of Theology and Social Work. Um, gay man and member of the Presbyterian Church USA. Yeah. Um, I actually went with Lisa. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I actually went with Lisa Largus to um, the General Assembly this past summer. Oh. Um, yeah, and she's been an individual who's been fighting for her uh, ordination for over two decades. Um, yes. And in discussion with her, she said, "You know, I've been I've given my life to this battle." Um, to have equality within the Presbyterian Church, um, but she questions whether my generation is going to have the patience for our church congregation to get around to um, equality. So um, I guess what I want to ask is, uh, what would you say to my generation about sticking through this, or is, is there hope in the Presbyterian Church, or any member of the Christian Church who's a part of a mainstream denomination that's struggling with this? Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, Lisa and I have had some discussions along those lines as well as the national board of, uh, that all may freely serve. Lisa is the uh, minister coordinator of uh, that all may freely serve. Um, Gene Southard, the pastor in the film, who was, was my pastor and who actually married um, my current wife Jen and I and is being tried for doing a same-sex marriage even though the people who accuse her of that don't accept me for as being a woman. It's <laughs> interesting. Um, she said that uh, someone that she knew from the civil rights movement taught her a very important question that if you're in a, in a room with a bigot, don't leave stay and teach. And that would be my advice, um, which is why I'm still here, which is why Lisa's still here, and many others of us. Um, I kind of like to think of myself as that little grain of sand in the oyster about, without which there would be no pearl. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, so I think there is hope. We've, we've, seen, um, we've seen movement, um, even in the Presbyterian Church, um, as overture after overture comes to get um, the prohibitive paragraph out of the Book of Order, uh, which is our church constitution. Um, each time, the vote gets closer and closer, and we're in the midst of another vote now 
and Boston Presbytery just uh, voted yes on the amendment to replace that paragraph. Um, and I think that your generation, um, you know, those who are in seminary and college now, those who are just reaching the point of, of being ordained um, in, in all the denominations that still have not become open and affirming, um, have, the, uh, have a rare opportunity to really lead the church um, universal um, towards an understanding of the gospel as essentially being one of love, and compassion, and mercy, and not one of pointing fingers and judgment and condemnation. And too many of us have grown up with that. But the message of Jesus was one of love and acceptance and compassion and mercy. And um, with this generation that's coming up, you know, you guys are going to be in power. You guys are going to be the commissioners at the general assemblies mm -hmm. and the pastors of churches and the Christian educators. Um, and you can use that to reach people and, and to let God reach people's hearts through that. Mm -hmm. And through that, the church will be changed. And those who don't want to change um, will probably leave. Mm -hmm. So goes history. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Yep, please, go ahead. Hi there. Hi. <laughs> I'm Brian King. I'm a director of a program on the North Shore of Massachusetts called PRISM LGBT Health. Mm -hmm. So we do a lot of programming up there. And um, one of the questions I always have is what were the social supports that were there for you when you were beginning your transition? Um, what were the crucial social supports, mm -hmm. if any? Mm -hmm. And also, if what wasn't there that you wish was there, that, um, that, that your society or providers mm -hmm. could have been providing. Mm -hmm. On the North Shore? <laughs> or just anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, and our program's in Beverly, right next to where, to <laughs> yeah. where you went to school. <laughs> Not too far from Gordon Conwell. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very conservative seminary. Um, there weren't really any resources on the North Shore at that time. We're talking um, you know, the 80s and the 90s. Um, I got connected with resources through the Tiffany Club of New England, which is based in Waltham. Mm -hmm. um, it was through them that I found um, my therapist. I was working with a therapist at the time whom I had gone to seminary with, actually. And, um, but we had reached a place where he didn't feel he had the, con the credentials and the, and the experience to take me the next step through transition. So um, we had to find a gender specialist. And so I f got hooked up with Diane Elleborn um, in Framingham. And uh, they kind of played um, relay with me for a while and handing off the baton back and forth. Um, so really, all the resources I found were were out were were away from the North Shore at that time. So when I, you know, a while back when I heard about you folks up there, I was extremely <laughs> happy that uh, that there's a group up there that trans people can be connected to. Mm -hmm. um, Yeah, if, you yeah know, I mean, that, right? I could say that um, it's certainly, uh, you know, I transitioned um, in a different age than, um, than Sarah and certainly a different um, environment. I actually transitioned to college. Um, what I can say is that from a provider's point of view, it's getting better because, f frankly, it's reacting to what's happening 
in our society, which is that trans people are coming out younger and younger. So we finally mm -hmm. can say we have trans youth. Uh, thankfully, we have um, places like the Sydney Bourne Center and um, mm -hmm. other institutions that are working with trans youth. And then, of course, our trans seniors. I would say we cannot forget our trans seniors and uh, working with the LGBT aging project on servicing them. So I would say um, it certainly is changing. Um, I think it's just the pace of change and it's that, you know, for me, where I belong to Harvard, um, uh, Harvard Vanguard, you know, they don't really have that much out there. I actually was looking on uh, what services they have for um, gender um, gender specialists or the like. They, the closest I came was, um, I think, like LGBT, but there was really emphasis on just lesbian women. And it was sort of like, okay, well, you know, they're trying. <laughs> but um, I, I would say it's, again, making sure that our issues are brought to the larger mainstream health providers and not just specialists. Because I think the other thing that's hard is that it's the access. Like our folks, the folks might be there, but they're in Framingham. Well, you know, for a kid who's living in Dorchester, that's not much. Exactly. So it's making sure that um, our, our community can access folks um, without much problem. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Alice, I would love to ask you if you, what you saw coming into this as a very new person, what kind of social supports maybe you needed to deal with whatever emotions you had in learning all of this? Because I know as a part of, not as a part of the trans community, I have a lot of questions and a lot of emotions that I have to deal with in trying to understand it. So I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about, did you need support systems and that sort of thing? I had a support <laughs> system, really. Um, truthfully, um, Not Sarah just me, but amazing. Jane. Yeah. Um, I mean, Sarah was so amazing the way you were so open um, with your story. But the thing that I was so struck by, which was so great, was um, through Jean and Sarah, I was able to uh, be invited, if you will, I guess, to the Tiffany Club a couple of, couple of times and uh, was able to attend some of the events, uh, trans events, like, what was the name of that big uh, New Year's Eve thing? First event. First, First event. event, thank you. And, and being at, uh, at some of these events, first event and, and going to the Tiffany Club, I was so struck by how eager and open a lot of the trans people in the mm -hmm. trans community are mm -hmm. to educate mm -hmm. and to talk about their stories and to share their mm -hmm. stories. Because I had in my head that, I mean, yes, it was a very closeted and is a closeted community mm -hmm. still. And yet, at the same time, they're just they're so <coughs> eager to tell their stories and be accepted and be out and just be, let, let's just live our lives and be accepted of who we are, please. And, and so I was so struck by that. It was just mm -hmm. such a great thing to be able to sit down and have these great people tell mm -hmm. me their stories. Mm -hmm. It was just, it was amazing. It was wonderful. And at that point, I really felt, you know, a level of comfort around these issues that I had not experienced before. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought that was really, uh, really important. Certainly important for, for my growth, sorry if I'm being, um, my growth as a sort of as an ally, LGBT ally, but also filmmaker and somebody trying to tell a story and represent people in this community and humanize these mm -hmm. issues in a way that is honest and, and positive and, um, and authentic, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. The other thing I would add in terms of the need for resources is um, support for family members and friends. Um, from the film, you can gather that my daughter had very few resources available to her, um, other than when she would come to visit and. Um, you know, she'd be able to meet with my therapist. Um, so she was basically on her own in dealing with a lot of this stuff. And in a, in a metropolitan area like Boston, uh, you can find some support groups like that. Uh, Diane and I used to run a support group called Friends and Family. Um, and I'm sure that there are groups like that in some of the other major metropolitan areas. but you know, in Spokane, Washington, or my hometown of Wichita, Kansas, uh, 
mm -hmm. uh, where there actually is an active trans group there. Mm -hmm. um, there needs to be support for friends and family because when someone goes through transition, everybody around them goes through transition. Right. It's not something you do in a vacuum. What you mm -hmm. do impacts all of those people around you. Mm -hmm. And there needs to be um, support and um, you know, a place for them to vent mm -hmm. um, and, and to deal with their, with their confusion and their anger and um, you know, they're wanting to be accepting but not quite being able to get there. Uh, those kinds of issues. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it's a little bit after nine, so I'd like to respect everyone's time and um, just do one last closing question, which is if you have one super important issue that we didn't talk about, whether it's ad advice to young people who are questioning or just one thing, like please write your representatives mm -hmm. just quickly. Just do that little shout out and mm -hmm. then we will do the raffle. Mm -hmm. Um, well, besides, please write to your representatives <laughs> and, and, and senators. Um, I would say to anyone who is involved in some way with the trans community, whether you are questioning yourselves or you are trans identified or you, you are, are dealing with a family member, etc., um, I would say know that you're not alone. <laughs> there are so many other folks out there. And do um, go online, um, go to bookstores, um, call MTPC, call JTI. I mean, there's so many folks out here that are, you know, as it were, have our, you know, hands open, ready to receive you. Um, but uh, I would say also um, take your time, that it's not a rush, and um, be comfortable with yourself and, and wherever you are, um, just do what, act when you are ready and, and don't feel that you need to um, do anything because someone on this side is saying you should do this or someone on, you know, be yourself. Mm -hmm. Oh no, go ahead. Well, I'm not sure I have anything to add except just to um, mention again that we have three screenings of the film coming up and if you know anybody who is, would be interested in seeing the film, please pick up a postcard. And, um, and also, um, if you can, you know, if you know of any venues where they would like to host the film, mm -hmm. let me know. Mm -hmm. and, um, and other like films um, that, would, that would present this community in a, in a positive light, mm -hmm. just to um, keep the media positive in whatever form it takes? Mm -hmm. Probably um, the biggest thing for me would be to, for the LGB community to understand that the T community isn't necessarily LGB, mm -hmm. that a lot of us are straight. Mm -hmm. I'm not one of them, but <laughs> a lot of us are. And um, Sometimes I get frustrated when I write LGBT as LGB hyphen T. <laughs> um, you know, to understand that um, that sexual orientation or what I like to call intimacy affinity um, is not determined by your gender identity or vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, and that in itself makes our experiences as gay, lesbian, bisexual men and women, and trans men and women, similar and yet very much different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and to be, um, to be gentle with ourselves about who we are. And the other issue I would bring up, um, Rafi touched on this a little bit, is our, our um, trans youth. Um, this is an age group that is really at risk. Um, if you can imagine, coming out to your parents as transsexual at the age of 16 and finding yourself on the street um, selling your body so you can pay for your hormones mm -hmm. off the street and God knows who's what, you know, God knows what is in those things. Um, there really needs to be um, an outreach and this is what is so frustrating me about the church. This is the kind of thing we should be involved with. Mm -hmm. Not persecuting people and keeping them from ministering but reaching out to marginalized communities like that. Um, but even those of you who are not um, part of the Christian church or some faith tradition can be involved in um, 
in setting policies and doing outreach to mm -hmm. trans young people. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you so much to our panelists, and thank you for thank coming. You. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah.